almost 27 years ago, I walked into a tiny foyer of a little sanctuary that sat next to an old farmhouse. And it was connected in the back by this kind of old buckled sidewalk. That was the building of Westside Baptist Church. In that small foyer, I met Betty Walling and Betty Coleman and Karen Alexander and Janita Biller and uh, Brenda Gower and Janie Kaminsky. And I knew then that this was a place I wanted to be. And then after hearing Pastor Kaminsky's preaching, I knew this was a place I needed to be and that this was where God was wanting me to be as well. Um, so for almost 27 years, Westside Baptist Church has loved on me and my husband, on our children, and now on our grandchildren. On that day when I walked into that tiny little foyer, I didn't just walk into a church building, I walked into my family. We would watch the construction of the building and decided to attend. And we met some very nice folks there. It is a pure joy and privilege to fellowship with all of you at Westside Baptist Church. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bruce. And I'm Diane. We started going to Westside Baptist about 20 years ago. And to be honest, we haven't believed a word the pastors have said unless they back it up with scripture. Wait a minute. They do back everything up with scripture. How unusual in these last days. Happy 41st anniversary. What Westside means to me is the family atmosphere that we have here. As our kids were growing up, many people took them under their wings because my family and my husband's family live so far away and I appreciated the love and the care that you folks gave to us. I love my Westside teachers. I love the hymns we sing. What do I like about Westside? God brought me out of a very dark place and my Westside family keeps me from going back. Since coming to Westside, I have grown a lot in the Lord. Uh, the spiritual leadership here has really helped me to have an outlook on life um, that desires to please God. Hi, I'm Beverly Stutchell, and what I appreciate about Westside is that we are such a family. We laugh together, cry together, pray together, study the Bible together, and you just can't beat that. Hello, Westside. Thank you for all the Bible teaching, the Bible preaching, the Bible sharing. Thank you for inspiring us to keep learning, growing, and seeking first the kingdom of God. Matthew 7, 7, God says... Knock, and the door shall be open. And seek, and you shall find. And ask, you will be given the key to this heart of mine. Thank you, Westside. Happy anniversary. It's number 41. What a blessing to hear those testimonies of really God's yeah. goodness to us. And yeah. we're so thankful for the Word of God that we have in His faithfulness. And uh, what a blessing it is to have church family that love the Lord and love each other. Yeah. So wasn't that a blessing? Yeah. Each one, a little bit of humor there, some serious stuff, and a wonderful solo to, to begin here. <laughs> and so we just praise the Lord. I was reminded of some verses in 2 Corinthians as I've been reading through there. And uh, just really neat, something that stuck out to me this morning was Paul was trying to get the fact across that our yes needs to be yes and our no, no. Uh, we need to be committed to the words that we say. Now, sometimes God intervenes and, and those things do change. We're human in that way. But, but notice here, Paul says this. He says, but as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. And he later says, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. He acknowledged that the yes, the commitment that he was making was because of really the Lord. And he goes on, he says this, for all the promises of God in him are yes. Every promise God makes, he will fulfill. And he has been so faithful and so good to Westside. He goes on and says, in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. 
Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit on our hearts as a guarantee. The, the, really the ministry of the Holy Spirit and sealing in that down payment, that earnestness of the Spirit that we have until one day we're in heaven with him. And so we just rejoice in God's goodness. I'm so thankful for Westside. Uh, it'll be 16 years uh, in a couple months for my family too, and it's neat to see really all of my family, all my kids have grown up here, and God has just been so good through Westside, so I praise him for that. Well, let's, uh, so we want to say welcome to our Facebook viewers uh, and those that are on our website watching. Glad you could be with us, and I hope that you can grow closer to the Lord and rejoice in his goodness and his faithfulness uh, during this service. And uh, why don't we just ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Let's pray and just thank him. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your faithfulness. Lord, we know, we are, we are thankful for Pastor Kaminsky and Miss Janie Kaminsky, Lord, as they came out so many years ago. And uh, Lord, how you really worked in their hearts. No doubt, there were times of um, discouragement, frustration, hard work, uh, mistakes, failures, all kinds of things. But Lord, you gave grace and mercy, and you were faithful. And I am so thankful for each one, really, is, is so many through the years that have made up Westside. It's, it's really not just about Pastor and Janie or, or me or my wife or any of the staff. It's, it's really about you and the family that you brought together. And Lord, even the newest person, the newest member, they're, they're a part of Westside. And they make Westside what it is. And so we just thank you um, for this light that we can be in Eugene, Oregon, in the Northwest and we just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be faithful to you. As the Allen said in tongue-in-cheek there, they never believed a word that any of the pastors said unless it was backed up by Scripture. Really, that ought to be our attitude. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be diligent, as the Bereans were, to search the Scriptures daily, to, to know the truth, to know about you. But not just to be hearers or readers, but to be doers of your word. And so, Lord, help Westside to stay faithful we pray that you would help, even during the midst of this epidemic, Lord, help us to latch hold, help us to reach out to one another, help us to share you, the God of all comfort, with each other, to be praying for one another, and be praying that we can gather soon. And we're excited for some of the ideas to do those things in the coming future. So have your hand upon our service now. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. the church. Join us in standing as we're here. Those of us, you online, join us as we sing the last verse. We are your church. With a shout, the bridegroom is returning. Heaven's friends will come to claim his own. We will rise and bring with him forever. We will sing
share a little bit about the history from a little different perspective uh, than maybe we've seen over the past few years. The Lord has blessed me greatly over the years and with a wonderful family that I was able to grow up in. My mom and dad both loved the Lord dearly and every time the church doors were open we were there. At six years of age in a Sunday school class uh, my teacher talked about the need of salvation and what Jesus had done for us on the cross. And so uh, I felt the, the burden that I needed to accept Jesus personally as my Savior. And from there I grew in our church and was baptized the very next year. And then in middle school I was, felt like I was called to be a pastor's wife. My sister was a great example of a pastor's wife to me and, and I just felt like that was my calling also. And then when we went to college, uh, my sophomore year, I met Greg Kaminsky, and that's when we started dating. We dated for about a year, and um, then he popped the question. Some people would think I popped the question, but we got engaged, and um, he explained to me that his calling in the ministry was to come out west and start a church. And so I was excited for him too, and, and for us, as we would be married and 1977 and and then we came out on a school bus and put everything we owned on it um, it's 80 steel chairs a pulpit our furniture a few things that we owned and a little still child's chair that I sat on as we drove eight days out here to Oregon we arrived in Eugene of March of 1979 and looked for a place to live which was on Echo Hollow Right after that, within the next few weeks, we were already checking with the school to see if we could meet there as a church. And so my husband started knocking on doors and inviting folks to come. And so our first service was the end of April of 1979. About three years after meeting in the Willamette High School, we were able to purchase property just down the street from our home and the school. And it was 1310 Echo Hollow and we were able to be there for quite a few years. We weren't sure what we were gonna use for seats for a while, so my husband and I um, bought, bought some wood and made our own pews. I brought my own piano from home and we used that for the services and uh, we just served the Lord the best we could there. Over the years, we saw our little congregation grow bigger and bigger. And we had wonderful people that came through that stayed with us for many years and some uh, moved on to other ministries and others helped us start 
ministries, like the Women's Missionary Society that we did with Mrs. Walling and um, Mrs. Coleman. And we had just wonderful times together, fellowshipping and, and uh, serving together. The little farmhouse that we had been in um, had been transformed into a sanctuary and then um, some addition added for Sunday school. But we had really outgrown that too because we'd gone to double services for 12 years and so we knew that we needed to do something. And in the past my husband had been looking for property but just wasn't coming up with anything. And then Dale Miller came to him one day and said, I found a place, Pastor, you just need to come look at it. And my husband thought, no, I've already looked for property for 10 years, I'm done with it. But he went ahead and came with him, looked at this property on Irving Road, and then saw the potential that God had for him. A verse that has meant very much to Greg and I is Psalm 8411. The Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. And not saying that we have always been upright. We've tried because our, our whole goal is to serve the Lord and to make a difference in people's lives. And uh, we just praise him for what he's done. He brought us from that little farmhouse to this wonderful place that we are meeting in presently, where we can even reach more people for the gospel, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to give him glory for that because it's been 41 years of so many people coming alongside and helping in these years to share the gospel and to praise and give glory to God. Thank you. We are so thankful for uh, my father-in-law, and um, I get to call her Bob, for the ladies in scripture that we see, like Ruth, like Eunice, who hold up the arms of men in ministry. And for 41 years, mom's had the opportunity to do that, and been extremely faithful and encouraging uh, to those of us who get to be part of the music ministry every Sunday as we sing, uh, as the choir sings, um, we get to see her heart put into the ministry. And it's a reflection of what they have done for our community, uh, but for the cross of Christ. And may it be an example to us as we continue forward, but may we look to the cross, may we raise it high, is that's been the goal of theirs and of Westside Baptist Church to present the cross, not any of us ourselves individually, but to share the gospel with the world and to those in need. It's because of that we can stand, we can sing, the church is one foundation. It's Jesus Christ the Lord. It's not any one of us. It's not anything that we could do. But Jesus Christ, as we build our foundation on him, we can see great and wonderful things happen. Join me in standing as we sing. The church is one foundation. And then we'll join in singing, Great is thy faithfulness. The church is one foundation. Is Jesus Christ the Lord?
here we go on the chorus. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see, all I have been in thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness, born unto me. Great singing this morning, you may be seated. At this time, Debbie Edwards is going to come and share, O oh, Rejoice in the Lord. Good morning. I wanted to do a video too, but now I get to do it in person. Over 26 years ago, it was by Denise Larson's husband, Mike, came to my job and handed me a brochure. And then my next door neighbor gave me the same brochure. And I'm like, two? Well, that's just a confirmation. I need to check out this church. And I am so glad because that was my second life had just begun. Met my husband and life just took on. We had three boys we raised in this church. And the Lord has shown me so many friendships and so many things that he has brought into my life. And I just said, Lord, just use me as you see fit. I'm not perfect, but his way is. So the song I want to bring to you today is penned by the great author, Ron Hamilton. He had penned the words from Job 23.10, but when I am tested, I shall be forth, come forth as gold. Thank you, Jane. God never moves without purpose or plan when trying his servant and more. Lord, all. 
and again I say rejoice. Amen. Thank you, Debbie. You know, this morning in the devotions I was reading in the book of Psalms, and the thing that came to my attention was that he delivers, but usually in deliverance that means you're in something. And so he delivers us out of the quagmire of life and the struggles that we go through. It doesn't mean that we don't have struggles. But we have a God who is a deliverer. He delivers us from the penalty and the power of sin at salvation. Aren't we glad for that? I've enjoyed this morning. Have you folks enjoyed it? I, I find it uh, interesting that today in our services we have probably about the same numbers we had in our very first service here at Westside Baptist Church. We had 22 in our very first service, so I'm glad you're here, and the testimonies in all 41 years God has taken care of us. I told my wife this morning, I says, honey, you've put up with me for 41 years. She quickly responded, no, it's been 43 years. <laughs> Bless her heart. I thank her for that testimony, and truly, she has been a champion, and uh, Mariah, truly, we don't always encourage those that have lifted up the hands and the hearts of those that have come alongside. And I trust that today we will be encouraged in the goodness of the church. That is my message this morning. I think 41 years God has given messages, and today is no different. Uh, two weeks ago, God laid this message on my heart, and I wish you were here to enjoy it. But those that are here, I pray that you'll turn your Bibles and turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Those at home and here, you have been given a handout. It is actually a fill-in-the-blank handout. Maybe you can get that out. We'll get to that portion of the, of, uh, the message. On, uh, we sent those in the email. I hope that you have those. You can fill it in and encourage you to write down verses as I go through this rather quickly. Uh, people are encouragement, of course. And I thank the Lord that this week... Uh, there were people who, just like the video, testimonies of people that uh, shared those things uh, uh, with me. And, and I think of hearing from Ruthie uh, Rankin who said 26 years ago she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And I thank the Lord for that. I got uh, a, an email uh, and a text from someone who uh, encouraged and said, you know, you spoke at... Uh, a, a preacher boys class and uh, back in the 90s and one man was influenced there and he is actually going out and starting a church now and thank the Lord for that and then a letter from Ryan this week it just timely letter Ryan uh, just what God has done in your life uh, though we've not seen Ryan in 10 years he wrote a letter and just to say how much the things have been happening in his life, and thank the Lord for that. So this morning, as we get into this, why is my church important to me? We don't want to forget that. In the Scriptures, it says, in Hebrews chapter 10, and uh, verse 24 and 25, and let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Not staying away from our meetings. I know we have to stay away today and uh, because of this. But I thank the Lord that someday we'll be able to come back together. Not staying away from our meetings as some habitually have done, but encouraging each other. And all the more as we see the day drawing near. Let's pray together. Father, I ask you to uh, put wind in the sails today of this preacher, as it is your word and your spirit that works. It is my prayer that the Holy Spirit would work in our hearts, both here and abroad. I pray that, Lord, that you will just grab us and that you will uh, gain our attention. And what and how important it is of our function as a church of believers. And we'll praise you for that today as you work in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, by way of introduction, this is a question 
how important is my church, or how important is the church, that is slipping in the poles of popularity. And I hope, boys and girls, you'll listen to some of these statistics that I give you. Uh, today, we are seeing a change in attitude about church. Uh, this is a statistic that is six years old, and I wish I could have found a more modern statistic, but the Barna Report back in 2014, that even six years ago, those who felt that church was somewhat important to those who felt that church was not important was six years ago, 50-50. That church attendance has been declining. Regular attendance, and I say that regular attendance is no longer regular attendance. And those, I read one thing, it was about being there 50 weeks out of 52 weeks or three times out of a month. Today, the average regular attender considers it regular attendance if you come one in four to six weeks. Today, 23% attend weekly, 10% almost weekly, 12% almost once a month, 24% seldom, and the highest statistic, 29% never. Paganism has come into our culture, but yet the church has influenced paganism over the history of mankind. You think about uh, the, the aspects of how important church is to the family and to marriage. What is marriage like without the Bible's definition of marriage? I read Will Durant and the history of civilization, and I'll tell you what, none of us in here could ever even imagine the thoughts that goes into man's minds of what would constitute a marriage. And yet today we're starting to see that paganism coming back into our society. You think of the family and uh, the biblical model of the family and the marital fidelity and we're talking about divorce and polygamy and pornography, the value of women, the value of children. Uh, there in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says marriage must be respected by all and the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge immoral people and adulterers. This is recorded in God's infallible word. We also see the value of culture in the area of art. So you think of Leonardo da Vinci. You think of music by Bach, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven. How about the entertainments of the gladiators, the coliseums, or the Hollywood in contrast to that which Christianity has brought into our culture? The more pagan we get, the more pagan things we see in Hollywood coming out. The value of education, the literacy of the Bible. People in our country learn to read through the Bible. The printing press was developed so that the Bible could be uh, printed. The schools, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, there to be sec uh, not secular, but schools of theology. You think of the contribution of Christian scientists like Bacon, Galileo, Pascal, Boyle, Newton, Kepler, Kevlin, and Pasteur. In the last a millennial, uh, between 1901 to 2000, two-thirds of Nobel Prize winners identified Christianity as their religion. How about the value of hospitals and missions? One British philosopher said the influence of Christianity remains the inspiration of much that is most hopeful in a sobering world. When I went to Paris, Today, Paris is an agno uh, not only agnostic, but an atheistic city. And they talk about gay Paris. I'm going to tell you something. In all of my life, I have never seen more miserable people than those in Paris. 
Think of the biblical truths that are brought out that shape our philosophy, our way of life. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? Do unto others as we want done to us. The two laws to love God, to love your neighbor, the good Samaritan. Jesus said there in Luke chapter 4, quoting back of the Old Testament Isaiah, He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He hath anointed me to preach. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives, to cover the sight of the blind, to set free the oppressed, to rescue people from hell to heaven, both here and there. As we remove the church, we do not see good things coming our way. How is it working out for us as we remove the Bible from our schools and prayer? Every man doing what's right in his own eyes. We see this in the history of Israel. We see this throughout the judges. We see this through the abomination of man when man does that which is right in his own eyes. And we think we can legislate morality and the laws will correct the sinfulness of man. The only thing that will correct man is the regeneration of the heart through the saving truth of Jesus Christ as their Savior. He came to deliver us out of the bondage of darkness and to give us light. The value of the church. You know, we go to the mechanic if our car needs to be fixed. Isn't that correct? We go to the doctor and the dentist if uh, we are sick physically. Man is sick spiritually because of the sin nature. And the real answer is Jesus Christ and what the Bible says. You shall know the truth and this truth will set you free. We talk about slavery and we talk about the struggles of life and things like that. Do you know the Bible has the right answers to all those aspects? People today are more enslaved than before the Civil War because of the addictions and the appetites of their sins. The church is a hospital for sinners. We are a work in progress here. The Bible talks about hypocrisy, and there's probably no one in the Bible that used that word more than the Lord Jesus Christ, because there is hypocrisy. Because it's not a religion, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. We take antioxidants, Anti-aging stuff, I say stuff because I don't know what it is, you can tell by the appearance. <laughs> we'll take vitamins, we'll want to stay healthy. One man said, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. If you knew what the stocks were going to do, would that cause you to change your investments? how you either put in or took out? If you knew the economy was going to crash? You know, God knows the end times. and He tells us that difficult times will come in the last days. And the solution is getting into the Word. Paul is telling Timothy this in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. And then he's going to get into the importance of preaching the Word. We hear about global warming. God knows about global warming, doesn't He? He says in the end times, the elements are going to melt. This world has not seen anything to the disasters that are going to come in the end times. Now we're going to get into the outline that you have there in front of you, and I encourage you to write down the verses. In fact, I have ten things. These were uh, put out uh, in an article that I read. I want to embellish them, add to them. It is my prayer that this is true about Westside Baptist Church, is what is the value of the church, a Christian church, a Bible-believing church. I would hope that you would text some of the thoughts that you have here. But take notes, if you would, and fill in the blanks. Number one is to hear the preaching of God's Word. You know, that is paramount at Westside. And I, I thank the Lord for the testimonies and those that talked about uh, how, what the church meant. I, again, think of Bruce and Diane saying those things. And, and it ought to be that way. 
The Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians in that they searched the things to find out, is that the truth? There's no preacher who is infallible. We need to take our sources from the Word of God. There's no religion that is correct in all aspects. But I'm going to tell you, the Bible is infallible. It is the Word of God, and it has been preserved over thousands of years, written over a period of 1,500 years on three different continents by 39 different offers. It is the Word of God because it is God's Word. He breathed it into the writers. As you come into our church, you see out here in the foyer, it says we want to have excellence in His Word. May God be glorified in that. But yet people are not coming to hear the Word, and they're staying home. And let me give you just, before we go on, just uh, the ten, ten reasons why people are not coming to church today. There's great affluence out there, and, and people don't think they need God. There's a higher focus on kids' activities. There's more travel. There's blended families. There's online options. Uh, the culture is uh, uh, disappearing uh, of, 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 of what sin is and reality of truth. There's self-directed spirituality. There's failures to see the direct benefit. Their value... Uh, 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 churches are valuing attendance over engagement... And there's a massive cultural shift. We need to be hearing the Word of God. As I said uh, there in Timothy, 2 Timothy, Paul tells uh, Timothy in the last writings of his, his words uh, uh, that before he's to die there, these are the last words of Paul. He says, before God, the Christ Jesus, who is going... To judge the living and the dead. He's telling Timothy this, a preacher. And by his appearing in his kingdom, I solemnly charge you. Uh, before the dead and his appearing in his kingdom, I solemnly charge you. Proclaim the message. Persist in it. Whether it's convenient or not. We are to rebuke. We're to correct. We're to encourage. Whether it's politically correct or not. And with great patience and teaching. In verse uh, 3, For the time will come when they will not intolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, will accumulate teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear something new. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. The greatest aspect, I believe, for Westside Baptist Church is to preach the Word. I'm thankful for the things that we have around here, like Faith Bible Institute, which you can sign up for, a three-year degree. There we have our, our online uh, classes right now that are going on on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and we can still participate even though we're not here physically. I want to encourage you the power of God's Word in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It says the Word of God is living. It's organic. It's personal. It's effective. The word effective there is the word energized. And it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And it works in our soul. Maybe that's why people don't want to come to church. Because they don't want to be under conviction. They want to go to a feel-good church rather than hearing what is thus saith the Lord. What does God have for me? What does God want me to improve in my life? He's able to divide the soul and the spirit. He's able to sort out these things in the joints and the marrows. It is a judge of the ideas and the thoughts of the heart. We had quite an interesting discussion in our Thursday Foundations class as we talked about God and hearing what God says. And people will say, well, you know, God said this to me and God said that to me and a good point was brought up. There's many people who are saying God's saying this and it's not according to the Word. How dare we say some things that this is what God says when it's not according to His Word. May God help us to be accurate on this. Number two, to participate in corporate worship. Do you know what I mean by that? There's something, even though we have a small number here, there's something about being here where we can say amen 
to that beautiful violin piece. Uh, we are your church. Rejoice in the Lord. And sing these words and pray together and worship together. There are many things that are online, isn't there? I mean, you can get, and you version has some wonderful Bible studies. And there's many great speakers on television. But there's nothing like being in my church, our church together. Amen to that? Praise the Lord for that. I, I, you know, we got an amen row here. You all need to say amen real loud. And encourage the preachers like saying, sick them to a bulldog. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I'll just say this, on Mother's Day, we're going to have another drive-in service. Praise the Lord for that. I enjoyed that service, didn't you? We'll do that at 10 o'clock. We get to come together. There's just something about seeing our brothers and sisters in the Lord. You'll notice in Acts chapter 2, when they got saved there, it says, and those who had accepted his message, they were baptized. And let me say this, the most uh, important decision you can make after you're saved, after you settle where you're going to spend eternity, that you go and get baptized, because that's an act of obedience, that's an act of testimony, telling people that Jesus Christ is your Lord. That day, 3,000 people were added to them. Do you know how many was the them there in that passage? <laughs> 120. Can you imagine, Brother Matt, if you had a church and you saw 120 go to 3,120 <laughs> in one day? Of course, the Bible goes on and talks about what they did. In verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves uh, to the apostles' teaching, biblical teaching, to the fellowship. Do you get that? Fellowship. The breaking of bread and the prayers. Praise God for the example of the very first church here as they met together, going house to house. And the Bible says that God added to the church daily such as should be saved. Number three on our list is the sharpening of iron. When we come together, we are able to sharpen each other. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another man. May God help us to sharpen each other in the understanding of the Word, in the understanding of what God would have for us in our lives. Number four, to exercise our giftedness. I don't think a lot of people understand this, but God has gifted those who have been born again with spiritual gifts, and the reason He gives those gifts is so that those would be incorporated into the services and into the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 has that list of gifts. There's a list in Ephesians chapter 4. There's some, uh, uh, well, I think one in 1 Peter chapter 3. There's there uh, listed in Romans chapter 12 in verse 6. It says, according to the grace given to us, we have different gifts. Each one that's sitting here, we have different gifts. We're not all uh, the same aspect of what God has laid on our hearts of what He would have us to do. To understand this, that when God saves us, He has created into us a, a, a vessel to be used for His glory. We know works does not save us. Ephesians uh, tells us uh, 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 this uh, let me go to the next verse. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us this. For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We know that we're not saved by uh, our works. But the Bible says in verse 10, He has created in us a workmanship in Christ Jesus to do the good works after you're saved, which He hath before ordained that we should walk in them and he calls us to come together and as he finishes this this list there in ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16 we need to understand that he makes this whole body the membership the people together fit together perfectly he brings us into the church he wants you to have a local church he wants you to belong to a local church and to get involved in that church 
as each part does its own special work. John, do you know that you have a special work here at Westside Baptist Church? Teresa, you have a special work here at Westside Baptist Church. I try to challenge our, our, our technicians back there. You have a special work as you have the opportunity to bring this to the world. Messages where people can hear and be brought under conviction and possibly come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. The special work. It helps the other parts to grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's why we're there. Can you imagine if I lost one of my fingers? Would that be a big deal if this week someone chopped off one of my fingers? You see, to God, each of us is a part of the body and a member. Yet today, people can just leave one church and go to another. I was thinking about this. Maybe it's, I don't want to be gross or anything, but can you imagine? I'm going to chop off my finger. I'm going to give it to you, Nathan. You have that finger. It won't look good on you, Nathan, let me tell you. We need to fit where we belong and belong where we fit. He talks about this not only there but he in chapter 2 and I think this is one of the most marvelous verses to me as far as the, what the church is all about he says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 built upon the foundation of the apostles boy the songs this morning were so great and the prophets Christ Jesus being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together growth into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. God, Paul is writing to the Ephesian church about them being joined together and how they belong there. You know, we have membership at Costco. We have membership at Bimart. We have membership at Netflix. We have membership at Amazon Prize. Prime, but what about the church? Do we see ourselves as a vital part of the church? Getting involved, being engaged. One of the reasons why people don't, uh, don't grow in their church is because they don't get engaged in their church. Uh, there in Luke chapter 10, the Lord instructed His disciples, He says, pray for the harvest. It's great. But pray for the, pray for the laborers because those are, are few. Let me read you that passage there, his instruction to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest, asking him to send more workers into his field. Number five, to encourage one another, including your pastor. And I've been encouraged this morning, I really have. Thank you, Debbie, for your words that you said here Janie, thank you for those words. It brought me to tears this morning as I think back over the 41 years that God has allowed us to serve here. Encouraging one another, including your pastor. The word encouragement or the word edify means to build up. There are many passages that are the one another passages. You know, if we're not assembled together, how can you do those things? Does that make sense? I hope you'll think about that. Paul, is he writing from prison to the uh, wonderful church there in Philippi, he says to them, he says, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. Always praying for, with joy for all of you in my every prayer. I thank the Lord that I get to pray every day for every one of you. I thank the Lord for what God has done at Westside Baptist Church the wonderful folks here. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am sure, verse 6 says of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because I have you in my heart. And you are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the establishment of the gospel. 
the church is there for the gospel. He encourages them. You find as he concludes this chapter, he asks them, strive together for the gospel. Do you know if a church loses its evangelistic effort, it will start having strife instead of striving. Important things that a church does. And we need to be on guard because wolves try to come in. And Paul writes to the Ephesian elders whom he loved greatly. And he says, be on guard of the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God. For he has purchased them with his own blood. The pastors are to care and to feed for the, the flock. To find godly mentors, number six. Not only to help pastors to grow as Timothy was encouraged in chapter 2, verse 2 in 2 Timothy. He says, in what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We are to be training people in the ministry. We are to be training people in the service of the King. And I'm going to tell you something. It is a great place to learn how to be a good husband. Would you not agree with me? It's a good place to learn how to be a good father, a good wife, a good mother, now or in the future for you that are not married like Nathan here. We walk with the wise. We associate with people that have character and moral values. We teach our children to walk that way as well. Number seven is we teach our kids to love God and the importance of the church. You know what? If it's not important to you, do you think it'll be important to your kids? This passage of scriptures in Luke chapter 6 verse 40 says, A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. And I want to encourage you parents to be a good teacher. Number eight, to be lights in the community. You can imagine as we come to church, there uh, we are a beacon uh, uh, to our community. That's why I, I don't like going shopping on Sundays. I don't like mowing my lawn on Sundays. I want to come to church on Sundays. And not only to come to church on Sunday, but I want to live my life so that people see Jesus Christ in there. The Bible says in John 13, 35, By this all men shall know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 brothers if someone is caught in any wrongdoing uh, excuse me this is uh, number 9 bear what each other's burden our time is running out bear each other's burden and in Galatians chapter 6 it says brothers if someone is caught in a wrongdoing you who are spiritual should restore such a person in the spirit of gentleness watching out for yourselves so that you won't be tempted also carry one another's burdens in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ these are things you cannot do on online church care and pray for each other i thank the lord for the folks here that are involved in those things and then lastly we got through 10 points rather quickly didn't we the last one is because god says to we need to become in the church the verse that i read at the beginning and let us concern be concerned about one another in in order to promote love and good works does this make sense now as we've went through the nine previously? What the church is about, what it should be about to be a healthy church. These things need to be at Westside Baptist. It needs to be in your life. It needs to be in my life. We're not playing church. We're not going through the motions. Not staying away from our meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other and the more as we see the day approaching. It seems like the gates of hell are trying to, to close the doors of the church and it's not being closed by the political aspects, it's being closed by the unfaithfulness of God's people. 
If we understood eternity is coming, we'd be more ambitious. David Jeremiah said, every believer is commanded to be plugged into the church. D.L. Moody said, church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood to a sick man. A.W. Tozer, understand this. 100 religious persons knit into a unity by careful organization does not constitute a church any more than 11 dead men make a football team. The first prerequisite is life always. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, then you've got this new life and you need to be in church serving Him and growing your life. And so I asked the question, are you part of a local church? Get into a Bible-believing church. Don't search one out that meets your fancy. Search one out that preaches the Word of God. And then I want to ask you, how valuable is your church? That's what I've been asking all along. But I want to ask this question, how valuable, how valuable are you to your church? Jesus left heaven because you were valuable enough to die for. Ian Bounds says this, and this is some of the concepts of which we will hopefully always have here at Westside Baptist Church. What the church needs today is not more machinery, or better, not new organizations, or more novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use. Men of prayer. Men mighty in prayer. The Holy Ghost does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men. Men of prayer. I want to challenge Westside Baptist Church. We need to be Spirit-led men of prayer and men and women. A prayer. Amen to that? Let's just bow our heads as we close our service today. The ten points we come to hear preaching, to participate in corporate worship, to sharpen iron, to exercise our giftedness, to encourage one another, to find godly mentors, to teach our children to love God and the importance of church. To be lights in our community. To bear one, another, one another's burdens. And God commands us. Have you taken a casual aspect to what God would have for you in your giftedness? Your call? God called me 49 years ago to be a pastor. And today I thank Him for allowing me the privilege to serve Him. When it's all said and done and we say our final goodbyes here in this life, we go on into eternity. Number one, you want to make sure that you're going to go to the right place because of Jesus Christ and you put your faith and trust in Him. Number two, you want to finish well the life that He's given you. And I'm going to tell you, the gates of hell are trying to thwart the church and you and to discourage you and defeat you and cause you to have struggles in your life so that you give up and you quit. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus Christ. So let's make the right decisions. Invite Christ into your heart. If you need to, make a commitment that when these doors are open, we're going to be there, we're going to serve, we're going to find what God has for us, and we're going to serve God until He comes back. And we're not going to give up. It's required in sewers that a man be found faithful. And I'm going to tell you something that's easy. It's far easier to give up at this point. But you'll discover the horrible consequences of that in the end. May God help us to be men of prayer, women of prayer, faithful, serving, doing what God wants. So we go in this invitation. God, you help us to make the right decisions. 
If you'd like to text me your decisions or you want some prayer or some counsel, you can text Pastor Nathan or myself and we'll get back with you. You can call us, get with us. We'll try to get back with those decisions for eternity might depend on what decision you make today. The thing that you might do today, you might find out 30 years later that you had an influence in a young man's life so that he is going to go out and now start another church. And it might be in eternity we find out what God has for us. God, you bless and work. Lord, we come to you today thankful for the opportunity that we have to be your church. We thank you that we are able to uh, come boldly before the throne because of the work that you did for us on the cross. And we ask that we would live um, as you've called us to live, that we would um, reach out to those in need, that we would uh, see the importance of not uh, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, that we would not... Um, be um, absent-minded about uh, what you've called us to do, but that we would be encouragers, that we would be uh, truth bearers, um, and that we would um, use this time, uh, though it's different, to uh, be bold in our witness for you. You are coming soon. We know that, uh, and we trust you. We love you. We thank you for uh, the words that were spoken this morning, may we apply them to our lives now, not just uh, hear them and go away saying uh, good service, but may we uh, take what we've heard and may we use it to uh, further your kingdom. We love you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We do want to thank you for uh, joining us today uh, here in person or uh, online. Um, we are thankful for the opportunities that we have to do that. Uh, we do have a few announcements coming up on April 28th at 7 p.m. Uh, we're going to have a marriage tune-up. So guys, uh, ladies, if you're sitting there next to your husband right now, here's what I want you to do. Take one finger, place it in your ear. Take your other finger, place it in your neighbor's No, I'm just kidding. Ladies, place both fingers in your ears. Gentlemen, I'm talking specifically to you right now. You have the opportunity to set this time aside, to get a snack, to put it on your calendar, and ask your wife to spend this time with you. Um, so make a point to do that. Uh, I'm going to make a point to do that, so hopefully my wife uh, has her ears uh, plugged as well. But um, this is going to be a great opportunity just for us to um, build our relationship uh, together at home. And this will be um, this Tuesday um, at 4 o'clock our time. That's right. This is 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so it's 4 o'clock um, our time. So be sure and... Uh, take note of that. Faith Bible Institute, um, registration is open for the fourth semester, and there is a $25 discount for those who um, are brand new or those who were not in the uh, spring semester class, so be sure and take uh, advantage of the discount that you can get to be involved in that. We also do have a virtual baby shower that is coming up for Jenna Shannon. Um, she has not had the baby yet, just so um, you know. This is a virtual baby shower for a baby to be born soon, uh, Mr. Miles. And so we are excited for uh, Matt and Jenna, and uh, they are registered on Amazon and Target uh, as well. You can go there and look some things up. At 10 o'clock on Mother's Day, um, kids... Men, uh, ladies, 
it's, it's Mother's Day. Uh, we're going to be doing a drive-in service, so bring your mother with you. I had the opportunity yesterday to talk to a gentleman named Gary. He said his mother is 81 years old, but she would love to come and uh, join us for this. Um, and so make a point to uh, bring your mom to church. Uh, it's, it'll be a great encouragement to you. We will be doing uh, the FM transmitter uh, out on the parking lot. This is short range, just so you know, you can't just tune in at home at 87.7. Uh, you need to physically be in our parking lot uh, for that to work. And then for those of you that cannot um, be here with us, we will also be live streaming uh, on Facebook. We will be handing out our new 2020 directories as well at that time. Uh, so there's some incentive if you were on the fence about being here in person, you're not going to get the physical copy unless you're here in person until a later date. So you're going to want to be here um, for that and uh, bring your mothers uh, with you uh, for that time. We are going to continue our day of fasting and prayer on Wednesday, so join us in that, uh, setting a time apart when we can pray uh, for our church and our community, uh, and it's been a great encouragement to me as we've taken some of these times just to focus a little more uh, on what the Lord uh, would have for us during this time. We will continue to stream our 7 o'clock service or uh, our study through prayer with Pastor Nathan on our Facebook Live. And then on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock as well, uh, Brother Chris Edwards is doing a Zoom class. And you can be involved in that, but you need to reach out to him or you can email uh, the secretary uh, and they'll make sure that you're able to be added to that class. Uh, but that's at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. And then on Thursday at 11 a.m., um, Pastor Kaminsky is doing Foundations Bible Truths for Christian Growth, and he can send you the link to that. Uh, but once again, you do need to reach out either to him or to uh, the secretary here at Westside so that they can get you uh, added to those things. We want to encourage you to continue to uh, give uh, during this time. Uh, we have missionaries. If you uh, look at how things are going for you right now financially, um, Keep in mind, we have missionaries who are completely dependent on where they are at because of the support that we've promised to help send them. And so um, your tithes and your offerings play a big part in these people being able to stay on the field and being able to continue to do the ministry that the Lord's called them to do. So we want to encourage you uh, to continue to give. The Lord loves a cheerful giver, and he will give back so much more than you could ever give uh, to him. So Think through what you have available during this time that you could even use to be an encouragement uh, to those who are in need. And then today, again, we are celebrating our 41st uh, year of ministry here, Westside Baptist Church, and we do want to say thank you uh, to Pastor uh, Greg and uh, Janie as they've had uh, a huge role in um, the church here and just thankful for the Lord uh, leading and guiding in their lives. We are going to also be having, I just want to make mention of a few things, um, that we're not on the slides. We will be planning to do a drive-in business meeting, so put this on your calendar and we'll continue to announce it, but this is gonna be a drive-in business meeting on Wednesday, the 20th of May. So this is giving you time to plan out, but it's gonna be a little different. We're gonna do our business meeting at 6.30 on Wednesday and it's gonna be drive-in style. Um, and we have a couple things that are gonna be covered. Um, I believe we're gonna be looking into bringing on some missionaries and some things like that. So you being here for us to be able to uh, do some of those uh, church uh, functions, um, to get the paperwork side of things covered and the voting and that type of thing, make your plans to be here um, for that. We are going to start our Sunday school in about 10 minutes, and we are not going to stop the live stream uh, today. We're going to continue that straight through, so you can just leave it running where it's at. And uh, my daughter, Mylea, she said, Dad, what I need you to do is turn around in the TV and say hi to me. And I got thinking about that, and you know what? Right now is a great time for you at home to turn around, maybe not physically, but turn around and say hi to someone. So I'm going to say hi to my Leah and McKenna and Melissa, um, even though they can't be here right now, and my mom in Florida. And I want to, to encourage you to do what I just did right there. Um, pull out your phone, call somebody, maybe FaceTime somebody real quick, and just say, hey, you know what? We can't be with you right now, but how are you doing? And what did you learn from the service today? We are thankful to be part of Westside, thankful for your part uh, in the family here at Westside, and we'll see you back with us in 10 minutes.
right? Was it was it was it one closer last time or was that the row you were in? Testing one, two, test, test. Can you hear me? Three, four.
message. And uh, I don't know about you, but I long to be back together with all of uh, God's people and uh, church family. And uh, I know at the same time we're setting habits up, and so <laughs> it could be easy for some of us not to come uh, back as well, but we've got to make sure that um, we keep all those things in perspective. Uh, I think we've had a great turnout online and things, but it, it doesn't, it's nothing, it's not the same as being here. So I think we do need to social distance a little better right there, though. So I don't know if you can be on that PK, that would be good. Just, um, can someone help with that? Because I think that's important for us. So um, we uh, do want to, we're going to be in the Word of God today in 2 Kings chapter 12. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 12. And so we are um, going to be looking and covering a lot of material today. Um, and so uh, I cannot do it all, but I'm looking forward to what God has for us in that way. And so the last couple lessons that we've had, we've looked at really... Um, God, God doing miraculous things. In miraculous times, uh, it means that there's going to be faith factors. There's going to be uh, times that it seems insurmountable. It's going to be hard, and it's not going to make sense in our own thoughts how we're going to overcome these things. And so we, we've got to look to God to help. And we saw that with Elijah and how Elijah made an axe head float back to the stick. Uh, how he he raised a, a widow's son or a, a woman's son. We saw God provide in multiple ways, and God even opened in the eyes of uh, Elijah's servant to see all the heavenly host that was there, and God blinding. And so God can work, and God can do miraculous things. In times like these, is when God can do some amazing things, and we don't understand. And so, uh, what a what a blessing to be a part of that. Uh, we also saw last week God in control. And uh, we saw a lot of heads fall and roll uh, last week. But all that was to show that God made promises that the sin of Ahab and Jezebel uh, would be judged. And God kept his word. And today, again, we'll see how God keeps his word and how he's faithful in that way. And so um, I want us today to, to think about uh, really God's grace. And I would say, you know, as we celebrate 41 years, it is God's grace and, and God's mercy. Um, I think really God gets all the glory in, in his being so faithful to us in, in our many times unfaithfulness. Um, now he is so good, but often when God gives grace, we need to respond in the right attitude. And, and what is the right response? What's the right response when God gifts us things where he just does super abundantly beyond what we can ask or think? What, what ought to be the response? We ought to praise him. We ought to thank him. And uh, it's so important, but so often I think, as this picture kind of shows, God gives us grace, and he helps us, and he heals us, and he does amazing things. No doubt, even with this virus, I mean, the curve has been bent big time. It's been flattened, I guess, however you say that. Um, but we can't get frustrated. We need to be thankful for that. We need to give God praise. And... Uh, you know, a lot of people, they'll want to say, well, it's the scientists and how they said to do social distancing and all those things. Uh, no, this is, there's, uh, sure, that's part of it, but we want to praise God for what he's done in that way. And so um, it's easy for us to, and we'll see this here, to trample God's grace. Have you ever gotten a gift that someone gave to you and you were like, I don't know if I want this gift? Right? You can kind of see that in her face, like, um, I don't know if that's a good gift. And that's one thing, right? It's one thing to get a gift, maybe somebody handmade that they took time and effort to make, but it, maybe it doesn't quite fit your color scheme or your style, um, but you still ought to be thankful. And uh, someone spent time doing that. But it's a whole nother thing to take a gift, throw it down on the gra ground and stomp on it and give it back. That's, that would be horrible, wouldn't it? But really in the passages we're going to see today, they took God's grace and God's gifts, and it's like they just stomped on it and said, God, I don't care what you just did. And they just turned the other way. And God help us not to have a heart like that. But I think that is what we're going to see time and time again here. And we need to just see God's grace and his help in that way in responding. And so I want to just, we're going to be in 2 Kings 13 and we'll try to get through verse chapter 17, and um, that's going to be difficult to do, but uh, we'll cover some. 
a little bit there, and then we'll also be in Second Chronicles, I believe it's chapter 20, 25. Um, and so if you want to even bookmark your Bible, chapter 25 of Second Chronicles, that would be good too. Um, but I just, I have to re go back a little bit from last week, and that is I want to look at Joash, or he's also called Jehoash in the Bible there. Joash, he was the one that was hid for six years in the palace of, um, remember the evil grandmother? <laughs> she went and killed all of her grandkids. Wow, wonderful grandmother, huh? just horrible. Um, but she was hid there by, it would have been her daughter, and so God, God hid her, and then Jehoiada, Jehoiada the, the priest, took him under his wing, and really, as they were together, Joash was a wonderful king. And he became king at a very, very, very young age, and God used him in a mighty way, but when that priest died, he changed, and his heart became really hard, and it's really a sad deal there. But I want us to see here in 2 Kings 12, 2 through 3, it's on the screen there. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoiada the priests instructed him, but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. And so, sad truth was, there wasn't a, a wholehearted turning to the Lord. And when the priest passed away, it's really, really unfortunate now as we go to Second Chronicles 24. It says, now after the death of this priest, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king and the king listened to them. Therefore, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served wooden images and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not listen. And th this actually blows my mind away. And I think it goes back to this idea God gives grace. He gifts us things but we don't respond in a right attitude and turning back to him. And I think this is the natural man. This is the human way. You know, God's getting us through, I believe, this virus, and there's still more to come, I'm sure, but we can't trample God's grace in this. We got to praise him and thank him. Um, but this is what's uh, it's hard to understand. Uh, this priest, Jehoiada, he has a son, Zechariah, I believe is his name. He comes along, and he's one of the priests and the prophets that comes and he, he says to Joash, you need to turn. You've had these wooden things, you need to do these things. And you know how Joash responds? He kills him. He kills the son of the priest that helped take care of him. How sad. I mean, can you believe that? Uh, such wickedness that really um, had turned his heart. And, and, and just so sad and such a reminder. So much so that even those in Judah realized... Um, the treachery and all the things that took place there. And we read in verse 20, And his servants arose and formed a conspiracy and killed Joash in the house of Milo, which goes down to Silla. They actually kill him, killed him, took him back, buried him with the other kings, and his son started reigning. And that really gets us to where we're at today. And it's just, again, a sobering reminder. Uh, he was a good king, but he turned to be a bad king at the end there. And so it's just sad. But we're going to see here really the tragic trampling of God's grace in verse, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9, we see God's grace for Israel, uh, for Jehoaz. Jehoaz was the son of Jehu. Remember Jehu? <laughs> Jehu was the one that was told to go and take out Ahab and his descendants. And uh, he did that, and he uh, must have been quite, we know he was quite the chariot driver, remember that? <laughs> But he, he was faithful, but he was quite, quite the military man. And so his son comes along here. And, and actually, we see some pretty good things. Uh, we see um, uh, some good things with him. But let's recap. We see the two, uh, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. And actually, today, we're going to see really the end of the northern kingdom, which we often call Israel. And so we have all that. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to see. This is the northern kingdom of Israel. These are the kings... <laughs> from Joash all the way down to Hoshea uh, that we will cover today, although I just I can't cover all of them in fullness. But really, we come to the end there, 722 B.C., and the northern kingdom is going to end. Was there ever any good godly kings of Israel in the north? The fact was there was none. And what was one of the biggest problems with Israel? It started wrong, didn't it? Jeroboam, the first, and we're going to see another Jeroboam today. 
But he started it. He didn't want them to go back to Jerusalem to worship. He set up those two different idols, those two different cities. And none of the other kings changed anything from that. And uh, God's, really, God's judgment ends up coming. Now, we do see God extending his mercy. And really, Israel went further than they should have. Really, the, the line did. But that was just God's mercy and God trying to help and in all that way. But today, we will see the conclusion. We will focus in on Joash, Jeroboam II. Um, and then those are probably the main ones we'll focus in on today. But then in the southern kingdom, right along with that, we're talking about Joash. Joash was the good king at the start, and then the priest died. He turned away, went to those wooden idols and things. And then Amaziah, uh, his son's going to come on board. Uh, Uzziah, Jothan, Ahaz. Ahaz, probably, uh, there's other ones, Manasseh, but Ahaz, and we're not going to be able to study him as much today. Ahaz becomes one of the most wicked kings of Judah. Ahaz is the one that he ends up altering the temple. He starts making it a pagan worship. He actually brings in, I believe it's the god Molech, and uh, this statue that they put a fire onto, and they start offering their own children on this brazen type of statue. And just so wicked. Uh, as I talked with Micah on the way over here, we were talking about worshiping the Lord. Um, and music styles and all that, and I realize there's different styles and things, but one thing I said to Micah is we need to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You know, what is the, what is the beauty of holiness? We know that Ahaz, he was changing that around big time. He, he took the brazen altar, or, or one of the things, he put it aside and made his own thing, and he started changing. We even know that the two, remember they offered strange fire, to the Lord, and what did God do? That, it, strange fire was simply not taking the fire from right outside the temple and taking it in for the incense. They just started their own fire. It was quicker. They thought maybe it was better, a, a simpler way, very pragmatic. God ends up swallowing them up. And so it's very important we do worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness, that we understand that our worship needs to be pleasing in his sight. The music, why do, why do we sing the songs we sing? Why do we worship the way we do? We want, to, we want to come back to that worshiping the Lord and the beauty of holiness. And holiness means to be set apart, to be distinct, to be different. And so Ahaz really goes the other way. Um, and that's, that's all I'm going to talk about him today, but just, just a sad state there. And so we see here God's, God judge Jehoaz's sin here in verses 1 through 3. Uh, we read of him, and we'll read there in, in chapter 13. In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaz, Ziah, king of Judah, uh, Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned 17 years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sons of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. So again, we go back to that first king, Jeroboam. He didn't depart from it. Uh, and verse 3 we read then, the, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And he delivered them into the hand of Haziel, king of Syria, into the hand of Ben-Hadid, this could be been the second or the third, uh, the son of Azaleel, all their days. Remember this king of the Syrians? Uh, not Assyria, but the Syrians. Remember this, this, was a, this was a bad dude, okay? He reigned 43 years, reigned through many kings of Israel and Judah. Um, and remember Elijah, or Elijah, when he anointed him, what did he do? He wept. Because he knew that this would be such an evil king and would cause all kinds of harm. And so this happens again here. And so the anger of the Lord comes about. And so I, I bring up this question. I brought this question up in our home builders class when we first started this series. But why would Jehoaz think, and these other kings after him, that he could get away with evil when Jeroboam clearly did not? Why did he think... That Jeroboam, like, we can keep this going. These two different altars, this, this, this wrong way of worshiping. Um, why did he think he could keep it going? Why, did, why didn't he change? Why didn't these other kings change and go back? You see this time and time again. Why didn't they change? What, why do you think? What are some possible reasons? No fear of God? Yeah. In a, he was set in his own ways. Um, Miss Janie? So once you believe a lie, you follow it. That's very true. The deception that comes about, PK? I don't think he equated the struggle with the reality of what he was doing. Yeah. 
didn't put two and two together. The struggles, the judgment, Mimi, with reality of what they were doing, so the, the consequences, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I say, we say that today, too. I think ultimately it's pride, because he, he felt like, hey, I'm better than Jer- Jeroboam. I can do it in such a way, I'm going to prosper, we're going to be good, God will be a smile on my life now. But, but it will never work that way. That's the deception of the heart. I think that's also in our society today, where we've seen different types of governments and things, and, and I don't want to get political here, but there's a next generation that says, well, we can do it, and we're going to make it work. You know, I can really get political. Well, we're going to keep giving out money and make it work, all right? So, um, anyways, to say all that, that's pride. We need to go back to worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness, putting him for, first, fearing him, and um, unfortunately we see this. But we do see God's grace here um, in God's, uh, what happens. And so, be here, God gave Jehoaz relief. Verse 4. So Jehoaz pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. And so we see here Jehoaz, though, even though he he had done evil, he had not turned from Jeroboam, he's calling out to the Lord for what? For help during this time of oppression. And, And that does happen, doesn't it? People do call out to the Lord. Um, that's why they say there's no, fox, or there's no atheists in foxholes, right? And he's calling out, he's pleading. Um, and then we read verse 5. Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer. God provided a deliverer that could come and step in and help. It reminds me really of the book of Judges. That, you know, at that point, God would put them in slavery, captivity. They would call out to the Lord. God would raise up a judge. He would free them, and then they got back in that cycle and pattern of going through that. But God brings out a, a deliverer. And what's interesting here is it's not, the deliverer isn't mentioned, who it was. There's some different thoughts on this. One is uh, that it was a king of Assyria that came in and attacked uh, the Syrians uh, from the north or from the side there, and so that gave relief to Israel, perhaps, maybe. Some say it was maybe Elijah, or Elijah, I mean, the second one. Uh, we'll see uh, this king call Elijah a particular name and that, um, here later, one of the kings. So maybe, and perhaps it was Jeroboam II who would come along. I don't know, Jeroboam II, Israel expanded way back to that of what it had been in, to Solomon. But we don't know, but the point here is not about the man, the deliverer. The point is about who? The one who gives the deliverance, which is God. And God can step in, and and, and here's something miraculous. God's stepping in and helping in this way. And so God brought this deliverer, and we we further read in verse 5, it says, So that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. Nevertheless... They did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, whom had made Israel sin, but walked in them. And the wooden image image also remained in Samaria, for he left of the army of Jehoaz only 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 foot soldiers. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoaz, all that he did, and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? And so Jehoaz rested with his fathers. Then Joash, or Jehoash, a king of Israel, comes into play. And so, really, um, very sad to see what's taking place. So what do you think God thought about Jehoaz's treatment of his delivering grace? He gave the grace, he gave the deliverer, he helped with the oppression, he helped with that, how do you think God responds to that? You know, and we don't just want to look at God's feelings and things, but ultimately God does have a, a heart. He is, uh, you know, that's again like stomping on that God's grace, that gift. And so probably we know that when we sin against, one of the, the, the righteous response to sin is really anger. It is the, the wrath of God. And God is a holy God. And so that's why we need a deliverer. We need Jesus um, in that way. But 
but just sad to see how he turns and then how he treats the grace of God. Then we go on, um, verses 10 through 25, we see God's grace for Israel with now Jehoash's son, Jehoash or Joash. Now here's again a time where the northern kingdom has a king that has the same name as the southern kingdom. Remember the first Joash we looked at earlier? He was the young boy, eight, who became king, and then priest died, and then he went bad. This is a different guy. This is Joash of the northern kingdom. He comes about, and God gives grace to him. God helps, um, and he's only 16 years old when he comes about uh, with these things, and so God gives us grace, um, and he goes and he seeks help from Elijah. He goes to Elijah. He realizes. That's why some people think that Elijah was the deliverer, that he was the one that gave deliverance because this king now is turning to uh, Elijah, and uh, he calls him some particular things here. And so um, uh, verse, uh, let's just read verse 10. It says, In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Joash, the son of Jehoaz, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned 16 years. Oh, I might have messed that up. He reigned 16 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam. We see it again, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin but walked in them. Now the rest of Acts of Joash, all that he did in his might, which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are not written in the Chronicles. So Joash rested. And then we have um, Jeroboam that's going to come about here. Um, uh, uh, let me see. All right, here we go. Let's go back a little bit. So uh, Joash sought Elijah's help. Verse, 10, uh, verse four, 14, let's go there. Elijah had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, O oh my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. So Joash here, what is he calling Elijah? He's calling him his father, right? He wasn't really his father, but it's almost like a spiritual father. And he, he calls him the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. That, what does that say about uh, Joash's seeking help from Elijah? Or what, was it, what does it show his view of Elijah, at least in his words? He's a what? Elijah has the power of God, right? Elijah wasn't a warrior, but Elijah was used greatly as he was used of the Lord. In these miracles and blinding, God used him to blind the men. And so verse 15, Elijah said to him, take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it, and Elijah put his hands on the king's hands, and he said, open the east window, and he opened it. Then Elijah said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. So he's seeking help here from Elijah. Elijah really uses an illustration, helps him to see that he puts, kind of puts his hands around him. They shoot the arrow out. And what he's saying is, you're going to have deliverance. This is, this is the deliverance you can have. Isn't this, you're seeking me for this help. And so then, we, then it goes on here. It's interesting. Uh, he says, then, then he said, Elijah said, take the arrows. So the king took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. This is interesting. Now we have to understand, some of us were like clueless, what, why am I supposed to strike the arrow to the ground? But understand, Elijah just took the time to, Elijah, to wrap his arms around and to help him shoot and then to say the deliverance. And so there was kind of a picture here, and this king is coming to this prophet to get help, and he does it three times, all right? And so then we see what that all means. Verse 19, And the man of God was angry with him and said, you, shall, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. And so it's interesting if you would have done more. And you think about that. Um, not that he was striking the ground because he was angry, but wanting to be victorious. And so here we have... Here we have something very interesting. We have them seeking God's sovereign hand and help, but yet here is his responsibility by faith 
to, to strike these arrows to the ground, and he only does it three times. Now, it's an interesting thing as we think about the, the sovereignty and the responsibility of man. He had the opportunity to do more, strike it more, and he would have had a bigger uh, deliverance and a, a, a bigger victory, but he only did it three. How much more when we pray, <laughs> ought we to pray specifically for God's hand in seeking his face? And not only that, how much more should we, as we're praying and depending upon him, step out in faith to see what God will do? I think often we what? We limit God, don't we? We limit God in what he can do. God can do far exceedingly above all that we can ask or think. So let's not pray short or think less. But, I'll, but it's easy, isn't it? Uh, Lord willing, I'm preaching from the book of Ruth. But seeing the, uh, for, for Mother's Day, but Naomi and Ruth, and Naomi's mindset is so limited on what God could do. And God does exceedingly above all that they could ask or think. And so what a wonderful promise for us and a help. And, and especially during these times, as it's very easy for us to limit God and what he's doing. But God is up to something great. But we need to trust him and walk by faith in that way. And so he sought, sought help. So what does this account tell you about God's willingness to help Israel? Now this is Israel, not Judah. This is the northern kingdom. This is with all the bad kings. What does it show about God's willingness to help? God was ready to help. He had already given the deliverer earlier. He'd helped out in different times. He's wanting. He's helping. Um, there's, there's a full willingness. And God wants to help. He, you know, there's a bigger picture in all these things. And so he sought help. And then God gave Jehoash victory, verses 20 through 25. We really see um, uh, God's victory in what, in what he does. And, it, and it's really neat. Uh, verses, uh, we keep going to verse 20. It says, Then Elijah died, and they buried him, and the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. I hate to just rush over Elijah died. Elijah was a great prophet for those many years. However, the last 40 or so years, there's not as much spoken about him. Not till kind of this end of his life here. And I don't know what that said. Like, the king is going to him. And the, the man of God was ready to help, Right? To, to intercede, and, but it's like he got forgotten. Let's not forget those folks that have went on. And, but he dies, and then this comes about in verse 21. So it was, as they were burying a man, this is something, that suddenly they spied a band of raiders, and they put the man in the tomb of Elijah. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elijah, he revived and stood on his feet. Oh, could you imagine? Dead man put him, trying to hide him, trying to do all this, and he comes back to life. It doesn't say how long he lived after that, and I don't think he was just like a, you know, a corpse or a zombie or something. I think he came back, which is amazing. But so the question here is, what does this account communicate about the power and grace available to those who turn from sin to God? God's helping, but even this man coming back to life, it's showing that what? I believe it's showing that the promises God had given Israel, especially through Elijah, God would fulfill. Even though Elijah had died, God was going to continue to fulfill those things. I mean, just amazing, just the bones. Um, and so uh, that's something to really think uh, upon is, is really something. But we just see there's no, there's no limit to God's power and his grace um, in what he can do. And then we just will skip over, I have it on the screen here, uh, but verses 22 and 23, reading your Bible, are on the screen. But again, this Haziel, king of Syria, remember he was the one Jehu cried about, uh, wept, or um, the prophet Elijah wept about how horrible of a king he was. He oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoaz, uh, Jehoaz. But the Lord was gracious to them. Had, he had compassion on them, and he regarded them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It would not yet destroy them or cast them from his presence. And so God was again showing mercy and grace, and he, he had given those promises. Now by the time we're in, we end today in chapter 17, God does put aside Israel. They just get so wicked and so bad, and they turn away. And, um, but ultimately, 
Uh, Judah would come later, but ultimately God made those promises to Jerusalem and to one day Israel come back and reunite. And what a, what a wonderful thing that is. And so uh, let's now go to Second Chronicles 25. This will be a little bit more in depth. As really, if you remember right, uh, First and Second Chronicles uh, go from more of a spiritual uh, aspect or looking at it uh, in particular to Judah as they relook at uh, First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. It is a, a recollection of this, and that's why in First and Second Kings we hear go go check the chron- the books of the Chronicles. Okay. And so in chapter 25 of 2 Chronicles, we see God's grace for Judah's Amaziah. Now Amaziah does, I believe, end up to be a a good king here, but he had some big issues here. He starts off right, and then he has issues. So chapter 25, verse 1, uh, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoden of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with the loyal heart. That's quite the phrase in, you know, in quotes there, with not, not with a loyal heart. Now it happened as soon as the kingdom was established for him that he executed his servants who had murdered his father, the king. Remember that? Joash? Remember he came bad? They execute. So he's now, he's, he's now taking out those people that executed his father. All right? But notice this. We, we do see his intent to please the Lord, his intent to understand um, the wickedness of man's heart, we, we read here um, in verse 4, However, it did not, he did not execute their children, of these ones that executed his dad, but did as it is written in the law of the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall the children be put to death for their fathers, but a person shall die for his own sin. I mean, that holds true today. All of us before God are sinners, and we will stand before God one day. Uh, with some of the men yesterday, we talked about the idea of parenting, how we want to instruct our children and help them to learn to obey and using pleasant words. But ultimately, our authority for parents and children is who? It's God. And uh, children need to see that ultimately God's the authority and one day will stand before him. But everybody, right? And so he's saying, hey, these children, they didn't, they didn't do this. So we're going to let them go. We're going to show mercy and grace in that way. And so that was... Uh, a real blessing in, in a way that he showed that he had a heart for God. Verse 5, Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and set over them captains of thousands and captains of hundreds according to their father's houses throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them to be 300,000 choice men able to go to war who could handle spear and shield. That's a lot of men. He's got a lot of soldiers here. Um, and they're well equipped. But then notice this, he also hired 100,000 mighty men of valor from Israel for 100 talents of silver. All right, and so so he hires these warriors from Israel. All right, was that, did that, did that work out very well in the past when Judah would always try to work together with Israel? No, it sure didn't. And remember Jehoshaphat, how he did that, and then his son ends up marrying Jezebel and Ahab's uh, daughter, and that's wicked Athaliah, and just horrible things. And so um, we really see God step in here, though, in his goodness. Verse 7, but, um, and by the way, for 100, uh, 100 talents of silver, we'll, we'll uh, kind of talk about what, how much that is here in a second, at least in today's standards, how, how heavy that is. And um, I don't know how much it would have fully been worth at that time. Maybe someone has a good study Bible. Mine fell short on that one this time. (laughs) Um, Verse 7, But a man of God came to him, saying, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the children of Ephraim. That's some good things to know, isn't it? The Lord is not with Ephraim, or not with Israel. We need to be careful of our associations and our relationships and friendships, right? Right? Um, those people that you're with, we need to understand that God may not be with them. And I, I think especially we try to help young people, my own kids, don't put yourself in a situation where you're with people that don't love God, and, and there will be problems that will come about. Yeah. And so he's saying, hey, listen, God's not with Israel. Why are you including them? This isn't going to be good. Notice here, though, what comes about. 
um, in verse 8, but if you go, be gone, be strong in battle. Even so, God shall make you fall before the enemy, for God has power to help and to overthrow. It's something the prophet says, you know what, you're going to do it, just go, be gone, just get going, <laughs> you know. But God, and, and notice here, it's actually the flip side of this. You go, God has power to overthrow. And he's talking about him, all right? Verse 9, then Amaziah said to the man of God, but what shall we do about the hundred talents which I've given to the troops of Israel? Okay, this is a hundred talents of silver. Uh, how much is this? This was a lot. Um, this was a whole lot. And so as I studied this out, it could have been anywhere from six to 8,000 pounds of silver. Okay, the commentary is a little bit variant there. So eight, six to 8,000 pounds of silver, uh, one pound of silver today okay, is worth about $209, all right, that's, silver is not as much as gold, okay, maybe back then, I don't know, I, I, I don't know the historical context on that, but even so, if it's 6,000 pounds in today's economy, that's over a million dollars, which might be worth even more here in a little bit, just kidding, um, and then, and then it ultimately could have been a million and a half to two million dollars, so we know even in today's economy, that would be a lot, it's a lot of silver, and so, what he's being asked is to give up all that money that he had already given to those people. You know, the, if you want to put God first in your life and serve him, there will be sacrifices. There will be times that you have to give up money. <laughs> Stuff that maybe you've had these relationships, you've had maybe unequally yoked relationships with other people, um, and, and God's saying, uh, I'm not talking about marriage here. I'm just talking about relationships or business dealings or whatever that is that you need to go the other way and you're, you're going to lose financially. Are you following me? It's just going to happen. But that's where faith comes in, doesn't it? Is God, can God do exceedingly above all that we ask or think? He sure can, yeah. And he can bring back far more than 6,000 pounds of silver, okay? He can do far beyond. And sometimes it's not materialistically, it's it's far better blessings for you and your family and generations to come too, all right? And so uh, we keep going here and, and seeing just God's grace. I should have put this point up there, but God promised Amaziah blessing, all right? And so uh, we'll keep going in verse 9 and 10. And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. Much more. So Amaziah discharged the troops that had come to him from Ephraim to go back home. Therefore, their anger was greatly aroused against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. So they're upset. Why are they upset? They got paid off. I mean, they got paid for doing nothing. <laughs> I mean, coming down, I guess. Why are they so upset? You know why they're upset? They wanted the spoils. They wanted to go in, conquer, and I get to grab stuff that I can take with me. So what do they end up doing? They get angry. And they go about Judah as they return, and they start spoiling those different cities in Judah and taking it away. Was there, with this spiritual decision of this king, was there ramifications in doing what was right? There sure was, wasn't there? Were people angry? Were people upset? Yes. Are you ever going to please everybody by following the Lord and putting him first? No. I can think of family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers, that as you put the Lord first, they're not going to understand. In fact, they're going to get angry at you. Because they, they, Again, God hasn't opened their eyes to spiritual truth. They're not going to understand because these are spiritual things that come from the Spirit of God. So as believers, do we, we should expect... We should expect at times that people will not understand and they will get upset as we follow the Lord. We just got to expect that. We need to understand that. Um, but is it worth it? He can give you far more, exceedingly more. And so if you want to stand up, if you want to follow the Lord, if you want to lead in a godly way, you just need to expect at times people are going to get upset. <laughs> okay? And um, not that we want to try to get up, upset or try to be some, some, do something goofy or weird or whatever. Uh, we don't want that. So, verse 9, what did the man of God communicate about God's power and, and grace? And I kind of already answered this, that God could do what? Far more. He can provide far more than what you're giving out. He can give 
grace upon grace, okay? And he can help. And his power is at our disposal. He can do some amazing things. And so if you can see the map behind me or on your screen there, this is what ends up happening is uh, these uh, 100,000 mercenaries from Israel, they're hired, and then they go back, um, and they go back on their way to Samaria, and they start plunder plundering all the different people. So I hope everybody got that uh, in that way. And so really, God, God ends up giving victory. God said that God would give victory to Am 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 Amaziah, and uh, he did it the right way, he did it God's way. Uh, verse 11, then Amaziah strengthened himself, and leading his people, he went to the valley of Saul and killed 10,000 of the people of Seir. And also the children of Judah took captive 10,000 alive, brought them to the top of the rock, and cast them down from the top of the rock, so that they all were dashed in pieces. Okay. Uh, verse 13, but as for the soldiers of the army which Amaziah had discharged, so that they would not go with him to battle, they raided the cities of Judah from Samaria to Beth Horon, killed 3,000 in them and took much spoil. And so where, who, who's it going into? This is the Edomites. The Edomites, they were somewhat relatives of Israel, and I can't remember how that was exactly. But the Edomites, when he talks about the rock and things, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about Petra. He's talking about these fortified homes and shelters that were in the rock. In fact, you can go to Petra today, and you can go, and I, I don't know if it's limestone or something where they... Redstone, some type of stone where you can work it, and there's all kinds of caves and stuff inside of it. Um, yeah, sand, something stone. <laughs> but they go in, they, they get a great victory. God does an amazing thing. God provides. If only we could learn from those victories to keep trusting him and not taking his grace for granted. And Judah, they defeat the Edomites, marches 10,000 captives to Petra, where they cast them from the cliff. Uh, the Edomites, they trusted in that cliff. You can read Obadiah. Obadiah talks about the Edomites and how they thought they would never fall, they would never fail, because they were from Petra. By the way, Jesus talks about Peter being a rock. You remember that? That's that word Petra. I believe it's the word Petra in Greek. Uh, and so, anyways... We can't trust in our own strength, our own fortification, whatever it is, our own bank account. We've got to put our trust in the Lord, and, and they were able to overcome them. Um, but I wish that Amaziah would have kept looking to the Lord, but unfortunately, what does he do? He goes and he takes the idols of the Edomites, and he takes them for himself and starts using them in his worship. God just did amazing, amazing things. But isn't it something, again, when God shows grace and mercy to us and he helps us and he blesses us, that in our blessings we can forget him. And actually our heart can be turned away from him. You know what? Count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials, various trials. Why? Because God is helping you to have patience, or that word can be translated endurance, perseverance, so that we can be a perfect work, that we can be complete. Why do we count it all joy? Because you know what Paul said? When I am weak, then am I strong. It, when we become so strong or we get kind of high up there, it's easy for us to get prideful, forget our God, and our heart turns away from him. And so we ought, to, we ought to be praising the Lord. I, I mean, really. Not, I don't, not for the trials, not for the virus, but we ought to be saying, God, I'm thankful how you are changing me. You're growing me through this. You're growing my faith. And um, I hope that's the case. And I hope it doesn't. I hope once we get through this, we don't just divert back to our heart being not as tender to the things of the Lord. Um, but uh, unfortunately, we see Amaziah, and he turns to this idolatry. And uh, it's very sad. Um, you can look at verse 14. Your Bibles are on the screen. But it says, If you had been with Amaziah as he set up the idols from Edom, what would you have said to him? In verse 14, as he took these things, he set them up. What would you have said to him as he's setting up these different idols? I would hope, be like, uh, you just realize you just conquered the people that had those idols? Yeah, they worked out real well for him, didn't they? <laughs> right? Didn't God say that he's the one that would give you victory? Um, I hope that, uh, by the way, I hope that we can lovingly confront one another in a private way. 
But that is, that is one of the blessings of the church. Pastor talked about iron sharpens iron. Okay? That, is a, that is a good thing. Spiritual confrontation, we ought to be thankful for that. Now, the Bible says you need to check your heart first. Make sure your eye doesn't have a beam in it, that you don't have any wrong attitude or whatever in your own heart. But we ought to be growing and helping each other to grow in that way. And so, um, just amazing. Um, so describe what Amaziah did to the grace of God uh, that God had given him. He just, he just took it and discarded it and said, okay, whatever, moving on with my new idols. It really is like a nice gift being thrown on the ground, stepped on and thrown back. Just, just sad. And God, God help us in that way. And then we read in verses 19 through 20, Indeed, you say that you have defeated the Edomites, and your heart is lifted to the to lifted up to boast. Stay at home now. Uh, this is the king of Israel saying to him, "Why should you meddle with trouble that you should fall, you and Judah with you?" But Amaziah would not heed, for it came from God, that he might give them into the hand of their enemy, because they sought the gods of. So Amaziah, his heart gets puffed up. He starts to boast. He says, you know what? I'm going to go take on Israel. We're going to go get the goods. We're going to go back after that 100,000 men that did those things. And the king says to him point blank, you're not going to win. In fact, you're going to be hurt big time. <laughs> it's kind of like an older brother saying to the little brother, <laughs> you know, I, I know you think you're big. I know you think you're something, like you took down your baby sister, but here I am, <laughs> you know. And it's like the bigger brother is going to say, uh, you're going to learn a pretty big lesson from this one, all right? Um, and, and he does. But notice there, it does say that the Lord was allowing this, for it came from God. And so um, God loves you, and he will chasten you. He will discipline you. Um, and so we realize that. And so um, if we look on the map again, uh, we see here that uh, Joash defeated Judah came down, Joash breaks into the temple, and he steals all the treasures. He breaks through the wall, the temple. He steals all these things, and Amaziah really started out well, but he wasn't loyal to the Lord, and there's all kinds of problems that come about. And then we read here, after that time that Amaziah turned away from following the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and, and he fled to Lachish, but they sent after him to Lachish and killed him there. Then they brought him on horses and buried him with his father in the city of Judah. And so just a sad thing. And I, I know we're running out of time. But then we see really God's grace for Israel's Jeroboam II. All right, the first Jeroboam was the one we speak of every time that started this whole uh, evil worship of God. Um, and so Jeroboam comes on the scene and God, God really does some amazing things uh, through Jeroboam. Uh, we read there that he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam the first, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He restored the territory, though, of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of the Arba, according to the word of the Lord of God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant Jonah, the prophet. Who, who is this Jonah guy? This is the Jonah that ends up going to Nineveh. By the way, this is the same Jonah. But God said he would do it. And isn't this something, even in spite of Jeroboam II's evil and wickedness and Israel's wickedness, Jeroboam expands the empire, the place there, to what it had been during the time of Solomon. And we see this, For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, and whether bond or free, there was no helper for Israel. The Lord did not say that he would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, the son of Joash. Unfortunately, it's just kind of prolonging everything in one way. But again, God showed his mercy, his grace, his help uh, through all of this. And of course, we know that's why, that's why Jonah also hated the Assyrians, because he knew what would come about. He didn't want to go there because he didn't want God to be forgiving and merciful to them. And uh, so we see, and, and uh, he just expanded you. I don't know if you can see that little dotted line, but he expanded it to the most that had, had been ever since Solomon, which was amazing. But ultimately, the picture is getting grace, rejecting God. They, they all were given God's grace. Um, every king, and even the king of Judah, Amaziah, 
Jehoaz, he got relief from the Syrian oppression. Joash uh, defeated Syria three times. Remember the arrows in the ground? Jeroboam II defeated all Syria and recovered the land. But they rejected the Lord and turned from his goodness and his mercy, and they trampled it. And ultimately, God brings judgment on Israel. And that's where you can read about these other kings. Um, so one was only a king for 30 days. Uh, one becomes a leper, and he is under house quarantine for a while. <laughs> okay, um, And we read also about Judah and Ahaz, the one that turns to evil um, Molech and the offering of babies. And he's a, Jude, he's a king of Judah. Just very sad. But ultimately, it's a very sad ending to Israel because they really turn back to the gods of the land and they don't heed the, the preaching of the prophets and they never change the, the wrong worship. And God says, you know what? Uh, we're going to have to have the Assyrians come and you're going to be taken away. And there's something through that. It, it, we understand just how sad it was. There's a point. God is long-suffering. He is long-suffering. And we don't know when his time will come about exactly. Well, he will come in. He will judge the world. But it will come. It will come. God's long-suffering. It's not that he's not long-suffering. And there's going to be people that mock that and all that. But his time will come. It's, he's being very merciful and gracious with people to turn to him, And he was very gracious, very merciful to Israel, as we saw today. But they didn't turn back to him. And that day, that day came. Here's something that's really something. As the Assyrians came, they, they uh, got rid of Israel. They came and they refilled the land. And um, God sent lions. He sent lions about. And they went and those lions went and started just devouring people. Because in the land, they weren't worshiping the true and living God. And so they call out to those people that had been displaced. And they say, is there a prophet or a priest or someone that can come show us how to worship the Lord? <laughs> and that one comes back, shows them. But here's the amazing thing. The lions stop, but they just add the true God as one of the gods among many. And uh, just very sad, but very interesting to look at that. Hosea 14.9 says, who's wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. And so God help us, help our heart, because it's a daily thing, it really is, that where our heart is soft and tender, that we're allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Even as Paul prayed for the Ephesians, that they would be filled with the fullness of God and emptied of our own self. So help this preacher, <laughs> help that preacher, <laughs> help each of us, right? We need that. Yeah, each one of us. Amen. How has God shown you grace? Hopefully you know the Lord, right? But even his gifts all along. How have you responded to God's grace? How are you responding today to God's grace and his goodness? Lastly, how will you begin to respond to God's grace in your life? We want to go forward. Today's lesson was praise God for his grace to live by and to be thankful and live upon it. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful uh, for your word. And Lord, we just ask that you would cleanse us this morning. Um, it's so easy to not even see your hand, not even count our blessings, not even look up. It's much easier to complain, to whine, to fret, to be frustrated. Uh, to be angry, uh, but that is, that is the natural man. That is not the fruit of the Spirit. And so, Lord, we ask that you cleanse us and forgive us. And, Lord, help us not to trample your grace that you've given, but help us, Lord, to praise you for it. Help us to realize that your mercies are new every morning, to realize that, that you are faithful and just to forgive us when we confess our sin and to cleanse us. And uh, we're so thankful that no one, Satan and his accusations, whatever it is, can never take the fact away that we are your child. But Lord, since we're your child, you will discipline us and you, because you love us. So help us, Lord, to be aware, to praise you, and to act upon the grace that you give. We love you, Lord, now, and help us this week to please you and 
Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to come back together sooner than later. And uh, we're thankful that we can do a drive-in service coming up for Mother's Day. And I just pray you'd encourage each one and help each one, Lord, our church family, to love on each other and to keep in the Word of God, to minister to those around us and to be that light. So, Lord, we praise you. We thank you now and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless. You are dismissed. Amen.